This is the Mark series part 17, 17 now in the Mark series. And today we talk about Jesus raising the dead and healing a woman with a chronic illness. And I think that this passage is probably the best example in the Gospel of Mark of something really unique to the Gospel of Mark. And that's something I talked about previously called a Markin sandwich. A Markin sandwich. It's, a, it's like a literary technique that Mark uses that has been observed by this, those who read his, his, his book, you know. Uh, the Markin sandwich is like this, you know. Think of Mark starting a story, and that's like a piece of bread in the sandwich. And then there's the end of the story. That would be the other piece of bread in the sandwich. But what Mark does is it's like he opens the bread and he sticks a different story in the middle. So he has two stories, but they're not one after the other. Rather, one interrupts the other. And that's what we have in this Markin sandwich. So we'll talk about that today. Um, the story of Jesus raising this girl from the dead is interrupted by him healing this woman of her 12-year chronic illness. And I'm going to say this. These stories could easily have been just told separately, right? Like it just told like different events because they were different things. And while they did happen in this order, they're also recorded in this order for a reason. So I think that that's where we can gain insight. We can ask, hey, if I see a Mark and sandwich, these two stories, one put inside the other, there must be some relation between them. There must be some lesson that I'm to learn, some giving, being given an interpretation, in a sense, through the way it's done. It's really interesting stuff. But we're going to start by just reading the text, just reading the scripture, the word of God, Mark chapter 5, verse 21, all the way through 43. And as we do this, this is a step that we often skip. We're thinking about individual verses, but we haven't read the whole passage. So stick with me, have your full attention on this passage, and try to soak all that the scripture is saying into your mind, and we can analyze and think about it and try to apply it into our hearts and lives. And ask, like, why did the Holy Spirit give us this? You know, that's going to be the question we have. Mark 5, 21. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and on seeing him, fell at his feet, and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her, so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him. And pressing in on him. A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had gotten worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind and touched his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately, The flow of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official, saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion and the people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, Why uh, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the father's, the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old, and immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given her to eat. Okay, so that's the whole story. You can see there's two stories, one inside the other, right? The woman's story interrupts the story about Jairus and this child. Um, And we're going to go through this now verse by verse. We're going to look for main points and little neat insights that we can find here. And then we're going to ask, like, why the sandwich? Why the sandwich? So I'll kind of be towards the end of this 
um, of this study because I think that when we ask that question, it drives home perhaps why the Holy Spirit inspired this section to be written. There's a reason why this is recorded for us, even to apply into our hearts and lives right now. So here we are, Mark 5, 21. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. Um, so this is after Jesus has healed that, de- that demoniac, the guy who was possessed by thousands of demons, and Jesus then comes back across the Sea of Galilee again. Now, across the sea doesn't always mean like in a straight line all the way across the whole sea. It, it, you know, it, it almost seems like there was like a certain point. If they crossed anything over that, they would call that crossing the sea, like crossing the tracks. You know, going to the wrong side of town almost. is kind of how they looked at it. And so he, they came back to the right side of town, so to speak. Um, and there they are back near Capernaum. Word spreads fast. And when he, he left Capernaum, originally left that area and crossed over to heal the demoniac, he had left a crowd. Well, there's a crowd ready for him as soon as he arrives. Word spreads quick and he ends up staying by the seashore. And he's probably teaching or talking to people, doing what he's doing there. Um, the question I have as I look at the crowds of Jesus the crowds following Jesus in the Gospel of Mark is, why? Why are they following him? Because we know that many of them were not really followers of Jesus, but they're following Jesus. You know what I mean? They're following him around, but they don't see him as Lord. They don't really recognize who he is. They don't really understand the Gospel plan. They're, some of them are really believing, some of them are not. Um, are they here to submit to Jesus? Or are they just here to say, I, I just know you have power to do things and I want you to do things for me? You know, which is not entirely bad. But it is bad if it's absent of that sense of the lordship of Christ, right? I want God to help me, but I don't want to submit to him and yield to him as Lord of all. You can feel this tension in the Gospels when Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? This is, he, he's like, hey, there's a problem here. You're calling me Lord, but you're not doing what I say. It's like the simplest of rebukes. He's like, you use, you know, you, here's the word Lord. You keep using that word. But I do not think it means what you think it means, right? This is the problem. You're calling me Lord, but do you actually follow me? Do you see me as Lord? Do you just want the miracles of God or the help of God, the assistance of God for just getting through your day or your situation? Or do you want him, the person, right? The person of God in your life as your Lord. And the miracles, the purpose of the miracles is to confirm who Jesus is. We see this throughout the Gospels. It's confirmatory. Miracles aren't the end. They're just the confirmation of the message of the messenger, I should say. Because God is offering us real relationship in Christ. Not just help. Not just assistance from above. Love from above. Like an actual relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Keep this in mind. The center of Christianity is a relationship with God that is brought together through Jesus Christ. In fact, the incarnation itself speaks of this, doesn't it? God takes on flesh, becomes man. So God and man, we see God and man in Jesus. Because in Jesus, God and man are going to be brought together. I mean, this is about a relationship. It's about your relationship with God. Now, I do want to mention this application for people who do ministry. Because most of us, I think, serve in some capacity. Um, Crowds can be problematic. And they can even be annoying. And you can get bitter at crowds. Because you start judging them basically because you're like you guys aren't even here for the right reason what you, you know, nobody's helping pick up the chairs today or whatever the you know or even bigger issues with crowds that they can bug you um, yet Jesus took all that in stride and still ministered to the crowds even though they may have had ulterior motives even though there may have been some issues and some problems here and there and we have to guard our hearts and as we serve the Lord in ministry to not think we're sort of we can be um, less caring about the crowds than Jesus was Right? He still cared about them, even though he saw all the problems they had for what they were. It's a mixed bag, right? But crowds are the point. I mean, without the people, what's the point? Hey, man, if, I, if, I pre- if the room's totally empty and I preach, I got no interruptions. I don't have any weird faces. No one's falling asleep as I teach. But what's the point? Why am I even here now? You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a mixed bag, but that's the point. The point is ministering to people, and people are sloppy, and people are messy, and you're one of them, and I'm one of them. And um, we keep doing it anyways. Okay, so verse 22, it says, One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up and on seeing him fell at his feet and implored him earnestly saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him and the large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. This may have been quite a journey. Um, We're not really sure exactly how far he would have been 
to get from there to the location of, of Jairus' daughter. Um, the first question you might ask is, who's this Jairus guy? Well, he doesn't really come up again in scripture except for in this story. We don't really read about him again. But he's a, a ruler or a leader of the synagogue. He's, he's not just like an attendant in the synagogue, someone who helps out. He's like an authority in the synagogue. He may not have been the ultimate like president of the synagogue. There's debate on that, and I don't know the answer to that question. I'm reading commentaries and guys who know better than me, and they disagree with each other, and I'm not sure what the right answer is, but the point is, for sure, he's, he's one of the elders who's like a ruling elder in the synagogue. Perhaps he's like the ruler of the synagogue. There's some debate there. This is kind of a big deal in the scripture. If you notice this in Mark, Jairus is named once, and after that, he's just called the ruler of the synagogue, the guy from the synagogue, the synagogue leader, because we're, we're supposed to really focus on the idea that he's a leader in the synagogue. Why is that important? Because being a leader in the synagogue and saying that you are running to Jesus and falling at his feet and asking him for help is like not going to be good PR for you. They were really not happy with Jesus at this time, specifically religious leaders. And if there are, the leadership is opposed to Christ like they are, then what's really going to irk them is a synagogue leader bowing down to Jesus and asking him for help. This does not look good for their cause. Remember this, the Pharisees in the same area were already plotting to destroy him. We learned that from chapter 3, verse 6. So we have leaders who are plotting to destroy him. Then later on, we found out that scribes from Jerusalem, those are the big deal scribes. Those are like the respected scribes from Jerusalem. They had come to the area just to denounce Jesus. And they went so far as to say that he cast out demons by the power of Satan. So they were saying he was satanically empowered. And then here's this synagogue leader who's bowing down to Jesus. There may have been a huge cost to Jairus for doing this. There may have been a real cost. Um, maybe it was just embarrassment. Maybe he would just be embarrassed. Maybe he'd be ridiculed. Maybe he'd be set aside. Maybe it would undermine his, his place, not only in the synagogue, like it's just a power issue, but in the very, the people he loves and respects might stop loving and respecting him. That's the problem. So he may have had pride issues or he may have had fear of man, but he goes to Jesus and according to this passage, right, he gets on his feet or on, on, on the ground before Jesus' feet. He's bowing down to Jesus. Now in that culture, as even, even in our culture today, you just don't do this, right? Like you don't go and just bow down to somebody's feet casually. There's only two times when you think to do this. One, either it's God and you're worshiping God, so you bow down to worship God, or it's just someone who's like way superior to you way superior, like way up there on the scale of like sort of worldly authority and earthly power and kind of thing. So you bow down to them for that reason. In his position as a leader of the synagogue, what does it say about Christ that he bows down? And I want you to picture this in the mind of the first century Jew. They're gathered around Jesus, all this hubbub about Jesus, all the talk and the stories of miracles that you've heard. And now you're there, you're, you're seeing Jesus, he's just returned, you know, and you see Jairus, you're like, wait, that's Jairus. That's like the synagogue leader. And he comes to Jesus and he bows down to him. And he's begging him to come and heal his daughter. This would have been like a huge testimony to the, to the first century Jew at the time to look and go, whoa, Jesus, who is this Jesus? And this is, of course, what Mark is trying to get us to do. Right? The gospel of Mark is trying to get you to ask, who is Jesus? He's much higher, more exalted than you probably realize. So why did he risk it? Why did he risk all this uh, potential problems with his, with his culture and his people? Because he was desperate. That's why. Jairus was totally desperate. His daughter is dying. And he knows the truth about Jesus. At least to some extent, right? So he's like, forget it. Forget all this other stuff. Forget what people think about it. I just need Jesus. Okay? I need him to help. And so he goes to Christ. She's dying right then and there. Um, there are some people who will criticize religious people or religion or Christianity because they say that religion swoops into people's lives when they're at their lowest point. And um, I would say there's an element of truth to that. There is an element of truth to that. Many people, their testimonies involve them being at this terrible low point, and that's when they reached out to God and their lives were transformed. Um, but I would say also, this isn't necessarily a predatory thing. <laughs> this is just how serious we get when life is super terrible. Like, I'm just, I don't care about watching that TV show anymore. I, I don't care about these, the frivolous things and the complaints I had here and there because I just get very serious about what my real needs are. 
And so a lot of people, it's the brokenness of life that leads them to the place where they have the humility to say, okay, Jesus, I just need you. I don't care what the consequences are. I don't care what the cost is. Sometimes uh, felt needs, when we feel our needs really deeply, they show us what we really believe. And we've seen people do this where they, they're raising their fists at God and, um, and they're going through hard times and they're like, yeah, I know God's real. And they turn to God, you know, and then they say, I knew it all the time. I was just being a knucklehead, you know. And I'm not saying everybody's the same there, but there are plenty of those stories. Plenty of those stories. Pain can make us very sober-minded and our pride can disappear. And that's good because pride can blind us. We don't understand our own motives, our own reasons for rejecting God, railing against God. And then we're going through hardship and we realize how much we need him, to put it simply. And this is the beauty of the gospel. The Holy Spirit goes forward in, in the preaching of the gospel to convict people of their sin that they might have that sense of brokenness and pride to feel that they need Jesus. That's the idea. That sense of need comes directly from the Holy Spirit. Um, so the gospel taps into this, I believe, directly. So I think what we see in Jairus, if we're just evaluating this, trying to understand it and learn from it, we see not only faith, not only faith in Jesus, but a humble faith. And that's what I want to highlight here is I want us to notice this. A humble faith because it may have had great cost personally for him. And it may have been difficult to overcome things within him that would have resisted doing this. I wonder, though, if there's something about faith um, that just is humble in its like very nature. I just wonder if there's something about faith that's humble. Real faith that's, that's just humble. Because we often, th- some people think of faith as like this, I'm so, I have so much faith and so they're, they're bold as a lion, you know, that sense of faith. I'm, I more often experience the kind of faith that's a humble, <laughs> a humbling feeling, <laughs> you know, where I'm just like, the power is not mine. The resources aren't mine. The strength isn't mine. And I'm humbled and I trust in the Lord. And it seems like a different kind of side of the coin there. A deep sense of dependence and reliance and trust in God. He does it all. He does. He gets me salvation. He gets me through my trials. He gets me through all the weird mental hiccups that I got going on in my head and my brain and my heart. So I want to highlight something else. Uh, it's important in Mark that we realize this because while it's true that the Gospels say a lot of negative things about sort of like the leadership of Israel, they weren't all bad. They were not all bad. Here's Jairus bowing down to Jesus, praying, you know, asking for healing, praying to Jesus effectively, right? He's putting himself on the line. They were not all bad. Here's Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night because of the, the environment he's in. But yet he then comes forward to, uh, to take the body of Christ after, uh, after his death. Um, and there's others as well through the scriptures because the Bible's not against leaders. And the Bible, unlike what a lot of people think, is not against religious people. Jesus is not against religion at all. He's against man-made religion, self-imposed religion against the commands and teachings of God. That very much he's against, but not religion altogether. That's a weird modern confusion, which uh, we end up shooting ourselves in the foot because we don't realize this is, religion is not bad. It's false religion that's bad, but religion in the sense of seeking God, knowing God, that kind of thing. So not all the religious leaders were, were bad guys um, by any stretch. And so here's an example of one. Okay, then this story changes. That was the bread. That was the first piece of bread. Now we're going to get to the meat of the sandwich. The story totally shifts in verse 25. It says, A woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. So this is the description of her. In fact, if you look at this, it's like, bop, 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 all these participles, all these phrases, these little things about her that really cause you to have empathy for her. And they should anyways. That's, I think, by design. She had a hemorrhage for 12 years. This, this may be related to like a, when she, it's basically related to like when a woman hits a certain time of the month. That's the kind of concept. She had a flow of blood that would never stop, though. It didn't stop. It wasn't just once. It was all month long. Something was very wrong with her physically. And we don't know for sure exactly what it was. It may have been happening since the time she had been, um, Uh, you know, 12, 13 years old. That's a possibility. But a lot of stuff is revealed in the description of her. So let's just kind of take it in so we can understand what we're seeing. And take it in in the eyes of a Jewish culture, not our modern culture, but the ancient culture she was in. Because of this flow of blood, she was considered unclean. This is what maybe a lot of modern readers miss as they're reading the text. But if you read the whole Bible, you know it already, right? Because there's a blood issue. She's considered unclean. She couldn't touch others 
and couldn't be touched without making them unclean so that people would be avoiding touching her. And she would even be, you know, asked to like make it known that she was unclean so that they wouldn't accidentally touch her. I mean, to imagine what that's like for 12 years straight. She couldn't participate in worship in the temple. She couldn't engage in worship in the temple. She wasn't able to go in because of this uncleanness. It's possible that she was unmarried. If it's been happening for so long, and if she's a younger lady, then she probably just is unmarried. A guy's not marrying her in that condition, you know. So she may have been unmarried because of this. We don't know. I'm just guessing the possibility here. It says that she endured much at the hands of many physicians, and I who knows what really went on there, except some of you have endured much at the hands of physicians. <laughs> so you have an idea. And sometimes it's not as easy as they say it's going to be, and it doesn't work as well as they thought it was going to work, and some of us know exactly what we're talking about here. And um, I can't imagine back then some of the weird stuff that they had people do, especially when they got desperate, right? Especially when healing just didn't come, and they're like, well, that didn't work. Well, let's... Well, let's try this. Let's try that. And they start trying things and experimenting on you. And um, that is the situation she had. Ancient doctors could be helpful, it's true, but they could also be harmful. The Talmud actually rips on doctors. It just rips them to shreds in certain places in the Talmud. Uh, the Jewish the Jewish writings that trace back from 1st, 2nd, 3rd century area. Yeah, so she had spent all she had on these doctors. All the money she had. She had no more money for treatments. It was all gone. And it had grown worse. That's the last thing it says about her. It got worse. This is a pretty sorry state. She's actually worse off than she was before. This, this condition's progressively getting worse. That's really concerning. Now, I don't know if this was considered her, her fault by their culture. There's a good chance in their culture. And I'm not saying this isn't a biblical principle, but this is a first century cultural thing that they were going through. There's a good chance that they would have thought it was her fault. Well, yeah, you have this issue because you've sinned. Forget what the book of Job says, right? How horrible things can happen to people that it doesn't have to do with their sin. But they may have thought that this was because of her sin. This could have also caused another sort of um, alienation of her from her friends, from family, from other people around her, just kind of devaluing her. That's a possibility. But even if it was her sin, even if, it, even if that was true, Jesus is still the cure. And Jesus doesn't seem to care. Um, he doesn't seem to mention any, any such stuff. He's still the solution. So here we are, verse 27. It says, After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. And then it tells us why she did this, why she kind of snuck behind him to touch his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Now, chances are she probably had to touch a lot of people to get up there, right? And she's unclean and they're now ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. They're not like sinful because of it. it's a ceremonial thing. But she had to probably push through that crowd. She goes to touch him, which would have made him unclean. But she's just convinced, right? If I just touch his garments, I will get well. Verse 29, immediately the flow of her blood was dried up. Boom, instantaneous healing. Not gradual over time, miraculous right there in the moment, totally healed. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. She can tell she's healed. It's not just an adrenaline rush. She senses this ailment I've had, it's gone. This is like when you get better and you forgot what it was like to be better. And now you know, like, I know I'm better now because I'd forgotten what this felt like, you know, that she's feeling that. But it's interesting that she's basically sneaking, sneaking up to Jesus. This is a really interesting event. She sneaks up to Jesus through the crowd. Why is she sneaking? I ask this of myself as I'm studying for today. Is it that she's ashamed? I don't know if it's that she's ashamed. I mean, she's willing to go out there and do it. It may just be that she doesn't know if he's really going to help. Could that be it? She doesn't know if Jesus will really help. But no, because her touching his robe is because she's convinced he can help. And she wouldn't even be there doing all this if she didn't think that it would help. It might be that she just doesn't know if Jesus will stop for her. There's a huge crowd. They're all clustering around. He's making his way through the crowd. He's actually, it seems he's leaving, departing from the crowd. Maybe they're just kind of following with him at the time. He's on his way to go take care of Jairus' daughter. The ruler of the synagogue, this important guy. He's important. He's going to get the healing. He matters. Who am I? So she sneaks. <laughs> you know, she sneaks and she touches the robe. So I think it may be that she's desperate and she thinks he would help, but she doesn't expect attention. 
And so she kind of behaves in a way, the way of someone who doesn't expect help, doesn't expect attention, but still thinks that Jesus will, will somehow help her. She gets this in- immediate total healing. Um, a few things must have happened really quickly in her mind, at least I think. One is the realization, I'm healed. I'm healed. I'm free of this thing. I'm finally clean. And just, just the exhilaration of that, the excitement of that. But there's something else that should have run through her mind very quickly. And that should have been, Jesus is legit. Like, the manner of this healing, we're ramping things up in Mark. The manner of this healing, I just touched his robe and was healed. The edge of his robe and was healed. Who is this Jesus? That's the feeling coming off of us in the Gospel of Mark. And he he told us in the first chapter, but now he's trying to just continually reinforce that idea. So total instantaneous healing. And then she notices something that may have freaked her out a little bit. It was that Jesus stopped walking. Right? He's walking. He's on his way somewhere. And, and she feels this thing, physically feels it. And then he stops because he's aware as well. And so now things change. Verse 30, it says, Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And I just imagine she was like, freaking out a little bit, like just scared, intimidated. Maybe she's just embarrassed. Um, he's, he, and this is, this is the subject to much debate. This section right here where it says that Jesus perceived in himself the power proceeding from him. Some people would actually, you know, caricature this like Jesus is walking and he goes like, oh, who touched me? Like, and like he was drained. I don't think the text says that. I don't think we can validate that in scripture. It says power went out of him. It doesn't say he was out of power. Right? It doesn't say anything about him lacking anything at this point. He's aware. He has an awareness of divine power that is acting through uh, through someone who's through him and someone who has faith in him. So he um, so he he didn't have to stop and ask. He could have just been like, "Good, another person healed," and kept going. He stopped and asked because he wants to connect with this girl, with this woman. He wants to stop and have a moment with her. Interesting. Because when you go to Jesus, when you go to God, when you reach out to God for healing, for forgiveness, especially the ultimate healing, the forgiveness of our sins, he doesn't just heal you and keep walking. He wants to stop and know you. And I think he stops to to give her the attention that she thought she wouldn't get. In Romans 8, verse 15 and 16, it it tells us, um, But you've received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And that it's not just grace and forgiveness you get, it's also relationship with God as a child. You were adopted into a father-child relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So he says, who touched my garments? And he, he and I, I just noticed this. He not only knew that the power had gone out, he knew that it had happened through someone touching his garment. Like he was aware of even that. That it was the garment that was touched. Verse 32 says, and he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and, t- and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So she's scared. She's afraid and trembling. Why? Perhaps she's embarrassed. Maybe she thinks she's going to be rebuked or something. Um, but Jesus' response to her is so kind. He says, daughter. Give me other places where Jesus speaks so gently. Right? To just some random person. I think he knew what people needed to hear. He knew the hearts of people. He spoke just the right thing. But to her, maybe this one who's just so intimidated that she just touches the edge of, you know, just like that's as close as I'm allowed to get, you know. And he calls her daughter. He says, daughter. You can sense the compassion of Christ for them. And do I have to tell you this? That's because he cares about you. If he cares about this nobody woman, he cares about you. Especially in that first century culture, you understand how, like, diminutive her status would be. He individually cares about each of us. And that may seem like a simple like Sunday school, like children's school, like point to make. But you will never get past it. That God actually cares about you. When you're laying in bed and you're sitting there alone at home tonight. And you can say, Lord, you actually care about me. You actually care about me. I'm your child. 
through, through the, uh, the cleansing of Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I am your child. And that never gets old. He says to her, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. And this is a major point, and some, I think, will spin it so that this is all about healing. They look at this as, uh, they almost look at the Gospels as like a blueprint for how to reproduce the healings that we see in the Gospels. And um, I think the main point isn't that at all. I think the main point is faith. Faith, faith, faith. That's the main point. The point here is about having faith, believing in Christ. Believing in Christ, not about trying to create a a formula that you can reproduce that will cause other people to experience healings. Um, hey, if, if that works, great. But a lot of stuff people just fabricate. Um, and that, I don't want anything to do with that as probably you guys don't either. So here's a side note on um, on touching Jesus' garment. She touches his garment because she has this intense faith and feels maybe distanced a little bit though. Touches his garment. But later on in Mark 6, when Jesus is, is, um, is back sort of in the crowds walking around, Mark 6, 56, it says, wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak. And as many as touched it were being cured. So it's possible that this woman's story spread and then her faith caused others to have more confidence and more trust and more faith. So that's an, an, an interesting thing. Okay, so back to the bread. That's the story of that woman. Now we're back to the bread. Jairus and his daughter. We're, we're past the meat now. We'll do the rest of the bread. Then we'll discuss the sandwich as a whole. If I'm not killing my analogy too much. <laughs> Verse 35. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Uh, Luke mentions this as well. Uh, Matthew summarizes it as he often does. In Matthew, when he, when he records things that are in Mark, he tends to make them shorter. He compresses it down. So in Matthew, he just mentions, oh, when Jairus showed up, he's like, Jesus, my daughter's dead. Will you come heal her? Um, so he's just cramming the whole story into a, the short version. You know, then the uh, passage in Mark and Luke, we find out it was while he was on the way back to the house that these people came and delivered the message that the daughter had died. Sometimes um, people are trying to help and they don't have the same sort of ministry heart or awareness of what God's doing but they're trying to help. So they try to tell everybody how it should be done and they want to control the situation. I see this all the time in the YouTube comment section. <laughs> um, they show up and they're like, hey Jairus, she's dead. End of story, game over. Don't bug Jesus anymore. And I would just say, you guys can just keep yourself to yourself. <laughs> you, know? you don't know the agenda of Christ here. You're just making some assumptions. And you're not his representatives in that. Um, so verse 36 says, But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. And, and I just want to say, can you imagine how scared he felt? Your daughter is dead is the news he just re received. And how that impacted his heart. The, his greatest fear. His greatest fear. Now a reality. And Jesus says, Don't be afraid anymore. Just believe. Just believe. Now, Jesus, in this passage, verse 36, he, he, he interrupts them. He's overhearing them give the news about his daughter dying, and he overhears it and interrupts him. It's like he wants to stop him right there. Hey, hold up right there. Don't go down that road. Just trust. Just trust. I know what it looks like. I know how it feels, but you need to just redirect your, your in your hardship and this suffering and this trial, you're in. you need to redirect your faith towards me and just trust me. It's that simple. Get your focus back on Christ. So he says, just believe. Now, Jairus had seen, and we may miss this if we don't recognize there's a sandwich going on here. Jairus had just seen this woman be healed, right? He's with Jesus, and this whole thing happens. The woman gets healed, Jesus stops, and her flow of blood, all this stuff. That probably would have been a pretty big faith-encouraging thing. Right? So he has like some good encouragement to be trusting in Christ right now. Verse 37, And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. So at the, at the moment where the news comes that the daughter has died, Jesus says, crowd, you can't keep coming with us. It's just going to be us. In fact, not even all the disciples could go, right? Just Peter, James, John. That's interesting. That's interesting. He's going to do a similar thing when he gets to the house. He's going to be kicking people out. So there's just very few people there. Verse 38, they came to the house of the official, of the synagogue official. Notice again, he's called a synagogue official here. He's not being called Jairus. Um, that's an emphasis that's here. In verse 35, it happened as well, because we want to highlight that he is in that role. 
And he saw a commotion and the people loudly weeping and wailing. I don't know how many hours it took them to arrive to finally get to the home. I don't know how long this journey was or how many interruptions Jesus may have had along the way. Um, Jairus was far enough away and took long enough that they bothered to send messengers to tell him what had happened to his daughter. Um, So it was some kind of a journey, a trip. They're already having the mourning though. Now they have the weeping and the wailing. There's like flute players we read about in the other gospels. There's people who are mourning loudly. This is their culture. Boom, it's time to mourn. Let's ex- let's express. You know, in our culture, we're more conserved than that. In American culture, we tend to be more conserved than that. We tend to be like very somber and very quiet at funerals and those kinds of things. And uh, I'm not sure which one's better. Maybe it'd be better if we just screamed, you know, <laughs> and just in our and cried. And uh, and maybe that would be the better way to handle it for us. I don't even know. You know, handling that kind of grief is is not something that's very easy for anybody. But in verse 39, he says, Entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. Now, if anybody else said this, you'd probably dismiss it. But it's Jesus, right? And you've got it. It should get your attention. It's meant to get your attention. That he describes this dead girl as being asleep. Now, some liberal scholars want to say, This is evidence that she really wasn't even dead. She was actually just sleeping. Um, this, is, this is what you call taking verses out of context right, to, for your own agendas. It's clear, the text is clearly saying the, the girl had died and it had been some time since she had died. He's calling her asleep for a whole different reason. Verse 40, they laugh at him for this. They begin laughing at him, by putting, but putting them all out, so he just kicks them out. He took along the child's father and mother and his own companions, Peter, James, and John, and entered the room where the child was. So why does Jesus say she's asleep? Is he being ironic? He just enjoys irony. I mean, sometimes Jesus is ironic, but I don't think that's the case here. Is he just being mysterious? Jesus is just being like that mysterious teacher. Well, no, the mysteries of, of Christ aren't quite that kind of mysterious. There's a different sort of mystery that he, that he does. I think he's doing this to teach us something that's connected to Jesus' defeat of death. And we can connect this to, to the story of Lazarus because there's only two places in Scripture that I'm aware of where Jesus calls someone asleep who's actually dead. And the other one is in John 11. And it's the story of Lazarus. Lazarus dies. The real guy, right? His Mary and Martha are his sisters. He dies. And Jesus hears the report before it happens that he's dying, that he's super sick. Please come see him. Then in John 11, 11, it says, This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. And they don't get Jesus. They don't get what he's saying here. So their response is, the disciples then said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. They don't want to do the trip to go. They're like, he's going to be okay. He's fallen asleep. Now, Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So two times Jesus uses the, uh, this term sleep for someone who's dead, and both times people are confused by him. Why is he doing it? In both cases, he's about to raise them from the dead. In both cases, he says they're just sleeping, and in both cases, he wakes them up. He raises them from the dead. What is he teaching us? What's the point of all that? From a Christian view, because of Jesus Christ, and this is a huge deal, we can consider death sleep. This is not just a euphemism. Euphemisms for death. So-and-so passed away. It's not really what happened, right? We say it because it's softer than what really happened. It's hard to say those words when you've lost a loved one. It's really difficult. That's when you, that's when you lose it, right? How do I know? Because I'm a human like you. <laughs> that's when you lose it. When you have to tell someone what happened. So you use other words. But in Christianity, that's not the case. In Christianity, death is the wrong word because they're just sleeping. The reality is that that euphemistic phrase sleep is more accurate for a descriptor of what happens to someone who's in Christ. They sleep in Christ. And the scripture supports this because in the New Testament, they continue to do this. It's a concept picked up by the church. The disciples didn't get it originally, but after they saw Jesus rise from the dead and realized he'd given us victory over death, over the grave, they start using the same phrase, asleep. In 1 Corinthians 11.30, Paul says to the Corinthians about some who had died, it said, For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number 
sleep. He's speaking of them being dead. He's not speaking of sleep, in case you didn't know. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. And by sleep, he meant dead, but dead's the wrong word for a Christian because you're just sleeping. That's the point. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. I, I rejoice in this, by the way. This gets exciting to me because of how incredibly deeply we need this truth. Death is the worst thing we face in life. And you will face it. You have faced it and you'll, fa- and you'll face it again until you face your own. It is the biggest thing. We're subject to the fear of death, Scripture says. But Christ has delivered us from that fear so that we can rightly say death is the euphemism. It's the wrong word. Sleep is the right word. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, you believe that? Jesus died and rose again. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And this you've got to remind your heart of, lest you mourn like those who have no hope. Because you could be a Christian and be acting like it's not true in your heart. Because our hearts are weird like that. Right? But remind yourself of these things. Don't be ignorant. Don't be uninformed of this. If Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who've fallen asleep in Jesus. It's just so long for now. Um, And we need that. Now, their response when Jesus says they're sleeping, I think is ideal because it's the same as the world's response when they hear the stuff I just said. They laugh. (laughs) Ha 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 ha, that's cute. Sleep, ha ha. They laugh. and, And this is just what scripture says about those who deny the gospel. It's a folly to those who are unbelieving. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. Why? Because the Greeks think they're wise. Of course, now us, in the 21st century, we look back at the Greeks and we think, what? They thought they were wise? I mean, sure, they had some good philosophers and stuff, but generally speaking, they were backwards ancient people, right? But not like us today. Now, we're moderns. We're moderns and we get it and we know the folly of this whole resurrection thing. Ha, ha, ha. We laugh at it. Do you know that every generation that's ever existed thought they were the moderns? Has it ever occurred to you like that? This is, this is one of the conflicts between old and young generations. When you were young, if, or you are young now, when you were young, let's say, go for those of you that are no longer young, when you were young, you looked up and you thought, what do they know? What do they know? I know. What do they know? Then you got older and you look back at yourself at your young age and you think, what did I know? What an art did I know? And then you look at the new young people and you're like, what do you know? And they look at you and they think, what do you know? We know. You don't know. And my, my statement would just be like, none of us know, right? It's, we need to rely and trust in the things that God has revealed to us and shown us um, and rest and rely upon the truths that have been revealed in the inspired word of God. This is going to be how we're going to have comfort and know how we're going to know those things. We're going to have that strength that comes through there. Because, yeah, it's, it's foolishness. They're going to laugh. They laughed at Jesus. Don't be surprised if they laugh at you. May your heart go out to them. May your heart just go out to them. It seems a little odd to me that Jesus just lets them misunderstand really easily. But he does. Because sometimes Jesus allows their rejection of what seems like folly to them, he allows that to just be judgment upon them. You're laughing because something's wrong with you spiritually, right? The parable of the soils. You're just revealing what kind of soil you are. And Jesus will do that. Now, I don't really frequently want to say to someone, well, you're just revealing your soil. That's what that's, you know, I, don't, I don't know hearts. Christ knows hearts. Okay, but he did handle people sometimes this way where he just says, you laugh, you laugh, bye. Get out. It's not for you. You don't want it. That's fine. That seems to be the attitude. Um, now, <clears throat> we don't have <clears throat> this, this visual like sort of evidence of this girl rising from the dead like they did right there at the time. I mean, this would have been something they'd never forget. They even remember the words he says in verse 41, talitha kum. Like they remember in Aramaic, in the original language, right? Because it's like, that's that memory, the visceral. I remember and he said, little girl arise, you know, and she got up. But what we do have that's interesting is the evidence for the resurrection of someone else. That is Jesus himself. That Christ died and rose again. Now, when I studied into this, I genuinely thought I was going to find pretty much zero evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Because I just assumed that if it's hard to put together a cold case from 40 years ago, it's going to be even harder to put together one from 2,000 years ago about evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I was, 
I, as I slowly found there was more and more and more evidence for the events around the death and resurrection of Christ, uh, confirming the eyewitness testimony, the death of the apostles, their willingness to die for the things that they were proclaiming. The, I mean, just we could go on for literally hours about all the pieces of evidence that we can build in a case for the resurrection of Christ. What, what I finally came to is the conclusion, personally, what I really believe, God kept this evidence around because there just isn't this kind of evidence for ancient history. We just generally don't have any evidence like all this kind of support for random events, you know? And um, yeah, so I think we have some really good actual evidentiary support for those who want to have that to bolster and strengthen their faith or even lead them to Christ, as many have come to Christ, seeking to even debunk the resurrection of Christ and being led to the truth of it through the uh, evidence for the resurrection. But the main point here, um, well, we'll come to it in just a second. Cliffhanger, there's a main point. Verse 41, take the child, taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which translated means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began walking. So she's being active. For she was 12 years old and immediately they were completely astounded. No duh. Right? I can't, whether their jaws were dropping or their smiles were grinning to the point where their muscles hurt, right? Or they were just laughing. Because of just the hilarity of the, of the amazing moment that this is. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Were they squeezing her so hard? She was like, stop. You know, like, I don't know. But they're, they're astounded. His mother and father are there. And in verse 43, he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. That's interesting. Jesus healed the demoniac on the other side of the sea of Galilee, right? He says, go tell everybody. He comes back into this area where he's actually had a lot of miracles, very Jewish area, not a Gentile area, and he says, don't tell anyone. Again, this is because he's controlling, ultimately, the timing of the crucifixion. The point at which everyone's told about Jesus, that's when he's going to be crucified. When he comes in on the donkey, he's proclaiming himself as, I am the king of Israel, boom, you're crucified right after that. So to tell everyone is to cut his actual ministry short. So he's controlling the timing of this stuff. Then he says, something should be given her to eat. Something should be given her to eat. Now, while she was ill and dying, she probably wasn't able to eat. So her eating now and walking around is confirmation that she didn't just get better. She's not like, I'm trying to get a little better. I'm crawling out of bed. I'm feeling a little bit. Of she's totally healed. She's totally healed. She can eat. She's healthy. She's strong. Okay, so here's the question now. Why the sandwich? Why these two stories, one inside the other? What's the point of the sandwich? And so these are, at least to, to my understanding, some of the reasons that uh, the Holy Spirit may have inspired it to be written just this way. Both of these stories, as you compare them, Jairus and the woman, they both show humility and faith. Not just faith, right? But humility and faith. The woman, she's kind of crouching down. She's fearful. She's just touching the edge of his robe. The leader of the synagogue who bows down to Jesus gets on his face before Jesus. So it's not just faith, but humility and faith. And there's an element of faith that's humble. It's a humbling of my heart before God. And I need to be able to do that. I can't come to God on my terms. I got to come on his terms or else I'm not really coming. Both of these stories confirm Jesus' identity in a really intense way. Because remember, in Mark, things are ramping up. So here we've had Jesus healing people. We've had him cast out demons. Well, all of a sudden, Jesus cast a thousand, well, not just 1,000, up to 6,000 perhaps demons out of one guy. This is to ramp up the power of Jesus, to show you how glorious he is. Here, he doesn't just heal. He heals a 12-year-long chronic illness that doctors couldn't heal. When someone touches the edge of his robe, right? We're elevating the power of Christ. He doesn't just heal. He raises the dead, which is to say Jesus has what? Power over death. And that is at the heart of the gospel message. That he overcomes this thing, this great fate of all mankind. The deepest need of mankind. The need nobody talks about because we just don't see a solution in the world for it. But we have a solution in Christ. It's also true that in both cases, there are women. Right? There's a girl who's healed and there's a woman who's healed. Both cases, it's women both times. And um, I don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm going to venture a guess that this may just be to highlight Jesus' care and concern for women. Now, let me hit the brakes for a second and say, I'm not interested in pandering to modern, obnoxious hyperfeminism. I'm not interested in that. I'm talking Bible here, right? Biblical worldview. Um, in Christianity, in the Christian worldview, we have 
a God who made man and woman in his image, man and woman both in his image. This means that men and women have this incredible, invaluable quality in God's image. When Christ comes and he does things and he shows attention, stops, talks to the woman, calls her daughter, he gives her this kindness and attention. This is like an elevation of women. There's another example of this in um, elevation from the culture, I should say, not, not just in reality. It's just a proper treatment. But there's another example of this in the Mary and Martha story. You know the story in John, right? Mary and Martha are both there. Jesus is teaching. Mary wants to sit at the feet of Jesus. Martha is busy cooking, cleaning, doing whatever. She's being a good host. Not a bad thing. She's been a good host. She's taking care of people. That's a good thing. But she's irked because her sister is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And so she says, Jesus, tell my sister to help me. And here's where it's completely lost on modern audiences. You see, back then, girls didn't sit at the feet of rabbis. They're not disciples. Just guys are. It's just culturally weird. Mary wants to sit at the feet of Jesus. She feels that she can just go and sit down and act like she's a disciple. Come on, Jesus, tell her to come help me. And Jesus not only allows it, he affirms it because he says, Mary has chosen that better part. You're worried about lots of things. She's chosen the better part. He affirms her sitting at his feet and learning. That's kind of a big deal in their culture. We, we, don't, we don't get this. There may even be another intimation in this, in the phrase I read earlier in Romans 8, where it says that we're all sons of God. Now, it could just be that the text is using the term sons of God to refer to mankind inclusively as is not uncommon to say son, referring to all both men and women. But it could also be the idea that in Rome, uh, women and men, if you were adopted as a woman, adopted as a man, you had different rights. They weren't equal rights. So if we're all adopted and we're all sons of God, we all have the highest possible rights. And I think that might be in there as well. It's kind of neat, kind of neat stuff. So that could be a possible point for the sandwich here. Another possible point is um, without the sandwich, you could think that this leader is getting special treatment. That Jesus is going with the rabbi, or with the, um, not the rabbi, the, uh, the synagogue leader because he's a leader, right? So he's going to travel all that way to see him. But he wouldn't give that special attention to someone else. But with the sandwich in the middle and him giving all this attention to this woman, we realize that, no, 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 the attention was provided because of the faith of the individual. God pays attention to your faith and your trust in him. It's not your status. It's your, it's your humble faith as you trust in him. Also, both of these people are unclean, and ceremonial uncleanness was contagious. The girl would have continued to be unclean for days. Even the lady, even if she'd been healed, would have normally been considered unclean for days, several days afterwards. Jesus fixes them, cleanses them, yet he remains clean himself. In particular, you'd be really unclean for touching a dead body. Jesus grabs her by the hand. He doesn't just tell her to get up. He takes her by the hand and says, little girl, arise. When Jesus healed, there's no issue of uncleanness left. And this may be somehow a picture of the fact that he delivers us from, or I should say, fulfills the requirements of the law. So that even though the law would have made, now he would be unclean by law, by, the, by Leviticus, right? He's unclean now. They're still unclean. But no, nope, he touches them. He goes and after touching this woman who technically would make him unclean, he goes and touches somebody else that's unclean. So Jesus is delivering us from that. So maybe a picture of our relationship to the law through Jesus. Um, also a parallel of our sin because uncleanness ultimately is a picture of sin, I believe. And we've got in Jesus, he touches me and my sin, but both of us walk out clean. Right? That's the idea. Um, some think, here's another possible reason for the market sandwich. Some think, well, the woman was 12 years with the flow of blood, with that blood problem, and the girl was 12 years old. And so they go, it's the 12. It's interesting. And it is interesting that 12 is there. So they think, I think the woman was the girl's mother. The woman was the girl's mother. And that's a, an interesting opinion. I have heard it before, but I give it some thought. And when you look at the text of scripture, it says directly that it was the mother and father who went into the bedroom with Jesus. It's not the same woman. There is a mother for this girl, but it's not that lady. Verse 40 says it. He took along the child's father and mother and entered the room where the child was. And this, this woman was obviously not at the home taking care of her dying child. She was following Jesus because she heard he was there. This is a totally different kind of person. So then it kind of leaves us with the question, well, then why 12? Why has 12 come up twice in the passage? And I'm not really entirely sure. It could just be that it's stuck in their mind 
Um, it could be there's some kind of connection to tribes of Israel, 12 tribes and all that. And I will leave it to you guys to figure that out because I really don't know uh, if there is a particular connection there. Uh, but here's the lesson to all of us and then we'll go to your guys, your guys' uh, questions and we'll pray and all that. Um, the lesson to all of us is trust in Jesus humbly in the face of death. That's kind of a big lesson. And it's not something you just learn with your head. This is like a life thing. And the reality of the resurrection of Christ comes in and changes the way you view death. And you say, he's not dead. He's only sleeping. She's not dead. She's only sleeping. And the world might laugh, but that's their loss. And we need to have this deep in our hearts, deep in our hearts, because it is one of the greatest challenges that we'll face as Christians in our lives, any human's going to face in our lives. Um, we need to trust in Christ, even in the face of the bad news, like, the, like Jairus, as soon as he heard the bad news, Jesus is like, ah, wait, interrupts the bad news to say, trust in me, just trust. And this is kind of what we need to hear as well. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the truth of the resurrection of Christ. Um, we desperately need for our hearts to absorb that reality, to live it out, Lord, to live it out in our, in our minds, to have a deal with our feelings, Lord, as we face the corruption that's in this world and the pain and the suffering that we will go through, that those we love will go through. It's going to happen. It's happening now. It's going to happen again. Give us that vision of the resurrection of Jesus that has our hearts echoing the statement of Christ, she's only sleeping. He's only sleeping. I'll only be sleeping. We, um, we trust in the resurrection, Lord. We pray that you'd strengthen and encourage us, Lord, that you'd help us to have the boldness of Christ and people laughed at him. It didn't matter. We pray that we would be those who could share the hope and the trust and the truth that there is in Christ so that others might know the resurrection power of Christ as well in Jesus' name.